I don't know about you, but I can just dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. I'd be all right just basking in his presence. Amen? Amen? Why don't we do that? Why don't we bask in his presence? See, I don't believe that songs of worship and the preaching of the word are somehow in conflict with each other, that one breaks the flow from the other, but rather that God speaks to us through all of this. Yes. Same spirit. Same Holy Spirit still speaks through God's word to you and to me today. Are you ready to receive what he has for you today? I don't know if I'm ready.
was planning to save kayak things for another day. I may use it again. Act like it's new then. <laughs> Speaking of new, we're told that Jesus was about eight days old. His parents took him to the temple to dedicate this new baby. That's what's custom. And when they got there, there were two people expecting them. Anna and Simeon. Now, Simeon had received a word from the Lord. Both of these devout people expecting the Messiah. But Simeon had received a word from the Lord that he would not die before he saw the Messiah with his eyes. For generations, Centuries, God's people were expecting the anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior, to come. <coughs> Waiting, watching, but sitting in new. He was going to see him with his eyes. And when Mary and Joseph brought baby Jesus into the temple, Simeon saw, and he knew in that moment, this is the one. And he declared. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared to the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. My translation God, you did it! You said I would see him and I've seen him. My whole life's purpose is fulfilled simply in seeing Jesus. I can go home now. I can go home now. If I die in this very moment, I would feel fulfilled because God kept his promise to me. This is the one who will live. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Mary and Joseph, they already knew who Jesus was, but that God would reveal it to this man of faith in the temple. And that he would boldly speak, courageously proclaim, You know, Simeon wasn't done. He said something else. He looked at, right at Mary. And he said, This child is destined to call, cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then directly to Mary, the mother of Jesus, Simeon said, And a sword will pierce your own soul, too. The sword will pierce your own soul, too. Today we continue to explore and examine the words of love spoken from the cross by the Jesus, seven sayings of Jesus. The cross. I would invite you to turn to John chapter 19. <coughs> Beginning in verse 25. I'd ask that you stand as we read together for God's word. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. 
From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word, for the power that your written word speaks into our lives today. The power that your spoken word communicates to our hearts and applies to our circumstances. May your word breathe new life into me. May your word guide us as we come and as we go. In Jesus' name. Alright, I'm gonna just tell you, I don't think you can do this, but this is really more of a nose for me, and I need somebody in front of the whole town. I'm setting this here so that I remember my five people to join me before this service is over, okay? If I forget to do that, you can send me back up here. Alright? Okay, thank you. Because I already forgot. Okay, here we go. My forgetter is working real well right now. I just need my rememberer to do this as well. Anybody ever have that problem? You know, when you get to be my age, you know? Some church traditions say as much. But for whatever the 
the reason, what we know for sure, is that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was called upon from the cross to care for his own mother. Jesus, you may say, was passing the baton. When he saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. When Jesus addressed his mother as woman, I believe he meant her no insult. Rather, he showed her respect. May have been protecting her identity from the mob instead of saying mother and having everyone turn their attention to her, he just said woman. He could have been trying to keep from piercing her heart with a sword any worse than the pain that she already felt seeing her son there on the cross. He held back from saying, Mom. He said, Mom. The, the, the Greek word there, there, there are actually many uh, words in Greek that can be translated woman. This particular one can also mean wife. I was, I was talking to someone this morning about how interesting it is that when, when a woman says, that's a man. But she didn't usually say it with that voice that she does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's my man. Guys, puff up a little bit. Compliments, my man. What does that mean? She respects me. I'm a man. Lead. You know what's interesting though when a man says, that's my woman? That sounds totally different. They're my woman. It's hard to write it in English, but in the Greek, it wasn't an insult. It wasn't disconnected, but it was respect. He said, woman. Term of honor. Woman. Here's your son. Jesus was showing respect to his mother in that moment, just as he had done in John chapter 2 when he performed his first miracle of the wedding feast of Canaan. When the wine was gone, we read in John 2, 3, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. And he replied, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Some take that as a rebuke against her, but look at what she said next. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells me. She knows. He's spoken to her respectfully. She knows he's going to do something. She may not know exactly what. And I have no doubt that she had no idea how. But she knew that he could. <coughs> do whatever he tells you. So here at the cross, he says, woman, here is your son. He shows her that same respect. I'm going to do something amazing. And I respect you enough. And I'm going to honor you in the process. See, Jesus was taking responsibility on the cross. He could have cried. He could have whined. He could have moaned. He could have shouted for help. He said other things, but he forced out the words, not only woman. Here is your son. But he was responsible as Mary's oldest son to care for her, to nurture her. And there on the cross, he still bore the responsibility for his own mother as he carried the weight of the sins of the world. He took responsibility. Many believe that Jesus stepfather who raised him as his own son, Joseph, and most likely died, which would explain why Jesus' siblings and his mother are mentioned in accounts of his ministry years, but Joseph was not. Jesus, as the eldest son, was responsible for her care. And there on the cross, he continued to bear the burden of responsibility. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4, we read, If a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, and so repay their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. We live in a culture where, and I'm going to take a little bit of a risk here. My wife says usually, you know, if you have to apologize for what you're about to say before you say it, maybe you shouldn't say it. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize. That's wisdom. Okay. When wisdom speaks. So I'm not going to apologize for saying that we live in a culture where too often we put people out to pasture when they become advanced in years. When they're less physically capable to provide for themselves and for others, we shut them in. We set them aside. Too often to die loneliness. I don't think that's what in fact, I know it's not because God's Word tells us very clearly that it is our responsibility to care for our parents, for our grandparents. There's nothing whatsoever to suggest that John was Jesus' biological brother. But they were very close. I've had friends that I've I've said are closer than a brother to me. And here's Jesus, the responsible one, looking at his mother whom he loves and for whom he has cared. His mother who raised him and nurtured him and believed the impossible about him that he was in fact the Son of God. And he wanted the most trusted, most responsible care for her. Both an honor and a duty that he charged to John the Reverend. We read in John 19, 27, and to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple, John, took her into his home. He received her as his own mother and cared for her as only her own son would. It was a sacred trust. A sacred trust. The brothers of Joseph had betrayed not only their brother whom they threw into a pit and sold into slavery, they betrayed their father because this was their father's favorite son. So Reuben, this older son, comes back from encountering Pharaoh's number two man with the charge of bringing Benjamin, the one son that Israel clung to, so that their family might be fed. He asked the impossible as well, let me bring Benjamin, your youngest son. The only one who brings you comfort. It's a request that he didn't want to make. And he knew that if he made this request, that he would be responsible. That if his father trusted him, he could not violate that trust, for it was a sacred trust. And so he says something that is so rare. He said to his own father, you may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. This isn't, I swear on my father's grave, kind of stuff. He says, Dad, I'll commit the next generation. There's no father wants to see their sons go to death. Now, surely Israel wouldn't kill his own grandsons. <coughs> But here's Reuben putting his neck out on the line and saying, I'm going to protect Benjamin with my life. It's a sacred trust. A sacred trust that Jesus 
placed in John. Care for my mother. She is now your mother. Sacred trust that John received, he took her into his own home. It's not enough. I'm not going to put her in a care center across town and go visit her from day to day. I'm not saying the care centers are great places. Some of them are wonderful and provide a level of care we can't. What I am saying is John took the responsibility serious. It was a sacred trust. He wanted to keep Mary as close to himself as he possibly could because he wanted to make sure that nothing happened to the mother of his Savior. Luke 16, 11. Jesus said, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Can I tell you, I find it intriguing that the one individual who Jesus singled out to care for his own mother is the only one of the twelve apostles of the church that is believed not to have been martyred. He lived out a full life. Perhaps over 100 years later than that. Isn't that interesting? And what did he do in those years? He cared for Jesus' mother. He proclaimed the gospel. He did the same things that got everybody else executed. He was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. And there Jesus appeared to him. John, the beloved. He gave to him a revelation. of the canon of the Bible. It tells us of Jesus' return and victory over sin. It describes the reward that waits for his followers for all eternity. This is the guy that Jesus singled out from the cross. In whom we place sacred trust after sacred trust after sacred trust. Why? I would submit to you that John was able to be trusted with little. So Jesus entrusted him with much. See, our God is a God of tender hearts. We read in Lamentations chapter 3, beginning at verse 31, no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Wait a minute, no one's cast off by the Lord forever? What about the hell? What about the final judgment? Does that mean that nobody goes to hell? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that God doesn't send anybody to hell. So great is his unfailing love. 
No matter how much it cost him, no matter how much it hurt him, he gave it all for you and for me so that we could have eternal life. So that no one would be cast off forever. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. God's will is that none should perish, but all should have eternal life. First Peter tells us. He's not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you. And me. He's patient with us. Not willing that any should perish. See, so God has a tender heart toward you and me, and he looks for tender hearts in us that we might be reconciled to him. And Jesus was talking to a group in Mark chapter 3. We, we read that his mother and his brothers not his cousins, as some understand that scripture to me. His brothers, his mother's children. They came to the door of the house where he was. The disciples came and they said, Jesus, we know you're really busy. We know that you're trying to save people from their sin. We know you're healing the sick. We, we know you're doing some real important stuff, but this is a biggie. Your mother and your brothers are at the door, Jesus. Figured you might want to drop everything for them. This is your family. And Jesus responds by looking at those seated in the circle around him and he said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. How much did he love Mary? And nothing from the cross he would make sure that someone cared for her. How much does he love you? Enough that from the cross, he cares for you. For my friends, if you do God's will, you are the brother, the sister, the mother of Jesus. I stop short of saying father because we know who the mother is. Amen? We are the family of God. And on the cross, on the cross, along with everything else that he said and did, he reminded us what family is really all about. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of foundation of the truth. You know, when I have the opportunity to visit with people in our church family who are in the hospital or the nursing home, and I don't get to visit everybody, there are some that I have, haven't even met yet that are part of this church family. Over and over what I hear is, you know, this person from our church was just here last week. That person comes so often. Or another cares. But I hear about people in our church family who are in their last days. I hear about how we pray for them, love them, and encourage them. And maybe some of you like me feel like I'm just not doing enough. I'm not visiting enough. I'm not there enough. I heard last week a pastor of a, a, a church that was doing a conference that we went to. He said, I just try to do for one what I wish I could do for all. If you and I have that mindset, I can't do everything for everybody, but I'm going to try to do for one what I wish I could do. See, that's how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. We ought to love one another. Because the household of God is the church of the living God. The pillar and foundation of the truth. Jesus
Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. People come to Jesus through his church, not because we're better, but because he called us to care for those in need, to love one another. Maybe today, maybe today, like me, you think, if I was standing there at the cross of Jesus, I just can't imagine that he would have turned to me and entrusted me with a task so close to his heart. He simply expects you and me to open our hearts and let it in. Because when he comes in, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ever ask or imagine. If you're here today and you've never let him in, you haven't made the choice to become part of God's household, I want to give you the opportunity right now to make what truly is the most important decision of your entire life. The decision to follow Jesus. He loves you enough that he's provided all that you need. I want to give you the opportunity right now to see all that he has for you. So everyone here is simply God and events on his own. I don't know if there's anybody here who needs to make this decision, but you know. And I want to give you the opportunity right now to take a step in the right direction. Step from Jesus. If you're here right now and you're ready to choose to follow Him, you want to be a part of the household of God, a family that loves one another, receives God's promise for eternal life. I'd like to pray with you. Would you just raise your hand right where you are so that I can acknowledge you. If you'd like to choose to follow Jesus today, would you raise your hand right here? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. How many of you want to see that? 
our sister would not only be used by you, but God, that she would receive and grow closer to you as we share life's journey together. Father, we lift Kathy up to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for bringing her into our church family. And we ask you right now, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in her heart, in her life, in her family. Provide for every need, and through the joy that abounds in her, Lord God, may you bless this body of believers and the community that surrounds us. Father, I ask you for little John, that as our brother is a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man of commitment, and he now takes the step of commitment to this church body, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would open for him doors of opportunity that he could never open for himself. God, help him to depend upon you to accomplish that which is impossible for him. God, may you pour out your blessings in his life, in his work, in his family, and in his ministry, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for Adrian. I ask you right now in the name of Jesus to continue the good work which you are doing in him. Lord, I pray that you would give to him the desires of his heart and provide for every need that he has. Lord, as you are raising him up to be a leader, God, I pray that you would equip him with the gifts necessary to lead others into relationship with you. God, use your vessel as you choose. Father, I thank you for my sister Glenn. I pray in the name of Jesus that our sister who is mature in the faith and committed to the work of the Lord, God, would be an example to many that as she walks arms with brothers and sisters in Christ in this church body, Lord God, there would be no limit to what you will accomplish through her. God, I pray that you would continue to bless her and her family, her community, her friends, Lord God, and that you would use her in greater ways in the days ahead than she has even imagined possible. Lord, as we share life's journey in growing relationship with you, may you 